Hey there, welcome to the Parkinson's Disease Education Podcast. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about cannabis and the potential benefits that cannabis has to help with Parkinson's symptoms. And also, we're going to be going into some things you should consider before trying cannabis, for example, safety, interactions with other drugs, and more. So if that sounds interesting to you, I'd love to talk with you more about that. And I'll see you on the other side of the intro. Hit it. Welcome to the Parkinson's Disease Education Show, where we demystify the disease and empower you as the person with Parkinson's disease to reach your true potential. The content contained on this show is for informational purposes only and is not meant to be a replacement for information or advice that you receive from your in-person medical or therapy professionals. If you haven't already, I hope you'll consider subscribing and for an even more personalized experience, please ask us about our memberships. Now, without further ado, let's start the show. So, cannabis. We're going to dive deep into this topic and open up a lot of information for you. If you are a caregiver or considering using cannabis to treat Parkinson's symptoms, this is certainly a good video podcast for you to watch or listen to. Um, We're going to first talk about how cannabis could potentially help with Parkinson's symptoms, which ones it may or may not help with. We're going to go into, as I mentioned before at the intro, potential medication interactions, things to watch out for as a person with Parkinson's uh, or certain medications you might be taking. Uh, We're going to also go into the different types of cannabis products available, and we're going to talk about best practices as well. So first of all, there's a couple of different chemicals found in cannabis products. Some are found individually and some are found in in combination forms, cannabidiol or CBD, and you have tetrahydrocannabinol or THC. THC is the chemical associated with the the high, or I guess you'd call it the low, associated with cannabis products. So not all cannabis products have THC that's going to give you a buzz or, um, or, or kind of have those hallucinogenic effects, for example. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that too, but some products contain one or the other or both. So which it, which it contains and what state you live in will depend on what products are available and what you can take. Be sure to stick around to the end of the episode. I'm going to provide you with a free downloadable PDF that has a summary of the different types of cannabis products we're discussing and some other helpful information as a guideline. So I'll make sure to provide you with the way to get that at the end. But in the meantime, let's go back into what symptoms of Parkinson's that cannabis may help with. So cannabis may help with some of the motor symptoms as well as some of the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. In terms of motor symptoms, tremors and rigidity seem to be the number one reported improvement in symptoms with cannabis use. However, there's mixed results in terms of clinical trials on that data. So there's not strong evidence yet that cannabis provides improvement of core motor symptoms compared to something like, say, levodopa. Now, I think where you might find more relief is going to be with non-motor symptoms, and we'll dive into that now. Now, as you know, non-motor symptoms tend to be harder to treat than the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, and non-motor symptoms arguably could even, in many cases, be worse than the motor symptoms. Not that either one is better than the other, but uh, non-motor symptoms can be very debilitating at times. Improvements in non-motor symptoms mainly potential would be with sleep disturbances, anxiety and depression, and pain syndromes that could include things like dystonia and muscle cramping. It actually could slow dyskinesia as well, even though I would categorize that as motor symptom. Sleep disturbances in particular respond to higher levels of cannabidiol or CBD. Insomnia, REM sleep behavioral disorder, and overall sleep quality could improve with use of this, this form of cannabis. Anxiety and depression, however, tend to respond to low dose CBD. In terms of pain, we mentioned muscle cramping, but it actually could help with neuropathic pain as well. So again, we talked a little bit about the different types of cannabis. I wanted to go in a little more detail and reiterate kind of symptom management with those. So CBD or cannabidiol tends to be non-psychoactive, so there's not the the results of the THC. There's generally good tolerance of CBD. There's not many side effects, if any, and it can help with anxiety, inflammation, and sleep. A lot of folks use CBD oil to help uh, before going to bed, to kind of calm things down, or as we mentioned before, it could potentially help with pain. Now, the psychoactive form, the THC tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, may help with pain as well, but it could also help with symptoms of nausea, 
it can cause actually some dizziness, confusion, or hallucinations. And that particularly may not be helpful if you already have cognitive issues with Parkinson's. What's really preferable is actually having a balanced THC CBD ratio uh, or the high CBD strains. That's typically preferred for persons with Parkinson's. So I wanna talk now about some potential risks and side effects and potential issues with drug interactions. This is really important to understand, especially if you're taking Parkinson's meds, as you'll see in a moment. Generally speaking, cannabis products can cause issues with cognitive impairment, particularly with THC, because it can cause more confusion or hallucinations, as we mentioned before. Orthostatic hypotension is a potential side effect, which can happen with Parkinson's and Parkinson's meds anyway. So it can lower your blood pressure, and that can increase your risk of basically passing out and having a fall. So you want to be very careful about that. It can also cause general symptoms of drowsiness and dizziness. And the most important fact is the drug interactions. And we're going to talk about that next. Dopaminergic drugs and serotonergic drugs in particular could be really risky to take if you're, well, I should say it's risky to take cannabis products if you're already taking those medications. And we'll go into that a little more in detail here. So with dopaminergic drugs like levodopa or carbidopa levodopa, <clears throat> you can have issues with a delayed absorption and it can increase or reduce dyskinesias depending on the interactions. So one of the ways it can delay absorption is that THC can actually slow down the gut motility uh, or, or emptying of the stomach. So you may have delayed onset of your medication dose because the medication is taking longer to get into the intestine where it's absorbed. Dopamine agonists may be problematic as well because if you're taking that alongside cannabis, it could heighten side effects such as impulsive behaviors or hallucinations. If you're taking alongside MAOB inhibitors such as risagiline or um, I just blanked on the other one, your MAOB inhibitors can be a problem with cannabis because of the fact that you could theoretically get something called serotonin syndrome. Uh, look that up if you want a little bit more detail on that. But um, serotonin syndrome is not a safe thing, and that, that's not necessarily a super common thing to happen, but anything that's going to um, mess with monoamine oxidase, um, that, that, that could affect levels of serotonin and give you too much serotonin levels, basically. It could also lower your blood pressure, and that goes into the general dopaminergic side effects, which we mentioned actually earlier before going into interactions, is that Dopaminergic medications anyway, can all, they can cause side effects of sedation, dizziness, orthostatic hypotension, and so forth. Cannabis can actually replicate that. So if you're taking them together, it could exacerbate those effects. Similar interactions can happen with antidepressants, especially SSRIs and SNRIs. So it can increase sedation and risk of serotonin syndrome, sort of similar to the MAOB inhibitors. And if you're taking TCAs, it can be problematic because you could have higher levels of the medication in your bloodstream, the TCA medications, because the CBD may inhibit liver enzymes. So basically your liver is not breaking down as much. So you may get too high of a dose of your meds. With any other atypical forms of antidepressants, you just want to look out for mood changes, drowsiness, or any increase in agitation. Finally, just want to make sure you consider the legal implications. Not every state will have the same legality in the United States in particular. You're not going to have the same legality in every single state in the union. So depending on what state you're in, you definitely want to, um, to look up those local laws. <clears throat> so briefly, I just wanted to mention the different types of products you might come across. Again, I will have that available in the downloadable uh, PDF that is a free product, and I will make sure at the end to let you know how to get that. You can find gummies or chocolates that contain THC or CBD or both, capsules and pills. There's tinctures, um, and those tinctures can be orally taken. Uh, there's topicals, oils you can put on the skin and so forth that contain one or both of the chemicals found. Uh, there's patches as well, so like sort of like a nicotine patch or something similar to that. There's also ways to vape it with vaporizers. Obviously, you can smoke it, and finally, more uncommonly, you may have suppository forms. So what are the overall best practices? First, start low and go slow. Don't rush into it, especially with products containing THC. You really want to make sure your response is adequate or appropriate. If you're already prone to hallucinations or confusion, avoid products with high levels of THC. Definitely monitor for side effects, especially if you're taking alongside Parkinson's drugs or psychiatric medications. 
always discuss use of cannabis with a neurologist or pharmacist before starting it. And finally, keep a journal of your symptoms to make sure you're tracking a response to these specific products. So let's wrap it all up in a bow. I want to give you a quick summary of everything we just talked about, and then we'll conclude and I'll get you that PDF. So cannabis, in short, may help with sleep disturbances, anxiety, and depression, with pain, which could include muscle, muscle pain or cramps, and some motor symptoms, particularly tremor and dyskinesia. It's unlikely to help with bradykinesia or slow, slowness of movement. It's also unlikely to help with problems of balance, postural instability, or gait problems. Medication interaction-wise, it could potentially have negative interactions with your dopaminergic Parkinson's medications, uh, your MAOB inhibitors, dopamine agonists, and, and more and also with antidepressants. So you just want to be cautious and make sure you consult with a physician before trying this. And again, as far as different types, pros and cons, and so forth, I want to provide you with that downloadable PDF. There's a link in the description or the show notes below where you can sign up for that. And all you have to do is provide your name and email and you can download it right away. It'll be sent to your email as, a, as an attachment. As always, thanks so much for being here. Let me know if there's something I didn't address that you'd like to hear more about with regarding cannabis. And I'd love to hear your feedback on how it's helped you. Be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already. Be sure to share this video with others that you think might benefit from this information. I'll see you in the next episode. As always, be empowered. Thanks so much.